Well, hello, Hearth and Homies. Tonight's compilation is the Old Time Radio Detective Compilation, Volume 20. That's right. Tonight's compilation is a grab bag of different shows. First up, we've got Mr. King, Tracer of Lost Persons, followed by Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator, with Boston Blackie up next. Then we'll finish out this compilation with the adventures of Rocky Jordan. As always, we've taken these classic old time radio shows and given them the OTR visual radio treatment. That's right. We've combined some beautiful scenery to your favorite old time radio shows for a unique old time radio viewing experience. So sit back and relax and enjoy the show. And as always, thanks for tuning in. Time now for Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons. <laughs> fast relief from the pains of simple headache or minor neuralgia, try Anison. For Anison is like a doctor's prescription. It gives you not just one, but a combination of medically active, tested ingredients. Relief comes incredibly fast. Take only as directed. Anison. A-N-A-C-I-N at your druggist. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Colin O's Toothpaste presents Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction and one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday at the same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing person cases. <laughs> Next time you buy a dentifrice, get high-polishing, high-foaming Colonos toothpaste or tooth powder. Colonos is a double-result dentifrice with a mouthwash effect built right in. Freshens your breath while you're brushing your teeth. Tomorrow, buy Colonos. <laughs> kindly old tracer and his assistant, Mike Clancy, poring over some documents in his office. Mike, uh, I'll see you to step in here for a moment. I want her to attest these signatures. Well, Mr. Keene, so Susie ain't in yet. Miss Al? Oh, my God. Do you suppose she's ill? I couldn't say, boss. Well, Mike, uh, bring her apartment right away. Yes, sir. I don't understand it. She's always so punctual. Well, you'd think she'd let you know if she was sick or something. Yes, that's right. Got me worried. But they're ringing, boss. I hear them. But I don't get the answer yet. Well, it's suffering cats here, Susie, now. Well, that's one phone call that hasn't aided the war. Oh, I'm sorry to be late, Mr. Keene. Well, what happened, Susie? Just as soon as I get my breath, Mr. Keene, I'll tell you. See, a family by the name of Nolan lives in the apartment below mine. There's the father, Jim Nolan, and his wife, Mary, and their daughter, Helen. Yes? Well, at 5.30 this morning, I was startled out of a sound sleep by hearing Helen cry out. She was calling, Daddy, don't leave me. Come away from there. I, I beg you. And then I heard violent sobbing. Huh. Family row, huh? Now, Susie, that ain't any reason. Mike, uh, don't interrupt. Go on, Susie. Well, I couldn't imagine what had happened. They're usually such a quiet family. And then this morning, just before I left for the office, well, Helen came to see me. Mr. King, she told me the strangest thing. She'd had a terrible dream about her father last night. A dream? And to cap it all, her mother told her this morning that her father hadn't been home all night. They're afraid something terrible's happened to him. Well, uh... Helen's nearly out of her mind. And, well, I, I brought her to along to the office with me. I wonder whether you'd talk to her, Mr. King. Well, uh... All right, Susie. Send her in. And I'll take these documents along now that Susie's coming. Yes, please do, Mike. Mr. Keene, this is Helen Nolan. Oh, come in, my dear, and sit down. Thank you, Mr. Keene. Susie has told me briefly what has happened, so suppose you let me ask you a few questions first. When did you last see your father? Yesterday evening, when he got home from work. And what does he do? He's a typesetter at the Daily Advocate. That's down on Center Street. Yes, go on, my dear. I'm sure he's been murdered, Mr. Keene. Murdered. 
I dreamed it last night as clear as could be. Oh, try to calm yourself, Helen. A dream is one thing and the facts of life quite another. Has anything happened lately that makes you believe someone wanted to murder your father? Oh, no, Mr. King. My father has no enemies. He leads the most regular life in the world. Well, he's never stayed out all night in his life, but my dream was so clear. Well, try to think back. Now, tell me, when you last saw your father, what were you doing? Well, last night I was seated at the piano when Dad returned home. You see, Mr. Keene, I, I love to sing, and just as I was beginning a song... Hello, Dad. That's a beautiful song. It's a dreamy song. It reminds me of you. Me? Dreamy? <laughs> you hear that, Mother? Well, come to think of it, perhaps you're right. Guess what tomorrow is? Tomorrow I'm celebrating. I've been working 25 years at the newspaper office, and I have a big surprise in store for you. Uh, Jim, Helen has to be leaving. Oh, that's so nice. Sorry, Dad, I've got a date, a very special one. I'll see you in the morning, and you can tell me your surprise then. And maybe I'll have one for you. I returned home quite late, Mr. King. Mother and Dad had both gone to bed, I suppose, and then later on I had that terrible dream. A nightmare. My father's been murdered, Mr. King, or he's in some awful danger. I know it. Well, tell me, Helen, how does your mother account for your dad's disappearance? Is it possible they had a quarrel? That's just it, Mr. King. I don't like to say this. You think she may be holding something back? I don't quite know. Well, suppose I have a talk with your mother. However, first I'll send Mike Clancy, my assistant, to your dad's newspaper office for a checkup. And Helen, I'd like you to remain close by where I can reach you very quickly. You're very kind, Mr. King. Do you think anything... My dear, try not to worry. I'll get working on this case right away. <laughs> To Jim Nolan's boss, like you asked him, Mr. Keene. What did he say, Mike? Well, sir, Nolan didn't show up at this newspaper office today at all. And he's always very punctual and a reliable worker. Hmm. The boss didn't know much about him in a personal way, so he suggested we talk to a fellow by the name of John Olson. He works with him, and he's right here in this office. All right, Mike. Let's go in. Are you John Olson? Yes, that's me. Well, my name is Keene, and this is Mike Clancy. How do you do? How do you do? We're inquiring about Jim Nolan. I understand that you and Jim are friends? Yes. Jim and me are just like that. He's a fine fella. Fine worker, too, but why didn't he come today? Well, that's what we want to find out. Maybe you can help us, John. Sure. Sure, I'll help, but how? Well, for some unknown reason, Jim Nolan has disappeared. Disappeared? Yes. Did he have any trouble here that you know of? Trouble? Oh, Jim and me and the rest here are like one big family. Then you'd know if he was worried about anything. Sure, Mr. Keene, but Jim, Jim was always happy. His, his head was always in the clouds. In the clouds? In what way? Well, one thing, he, he talked all the time about how he wanted a house in the country with cows and chickens and... Honeysuckle climbing all over the porch. Yeah, he talked about that all the time. A house in the country, you say? Well, that might explain something. Well, I hope so. Now, you find Jim, Mr. Keene. And say his old pals here want him back. Quick. All right, John. I'll do the best I can. Come along, Mike. We're going now to see Jim's wife, Mary Nolan. <laughs> I can't imagine why Jim didn't come home last night and why he didn't show up at work today. Are you sure? I'm going to ask you something, Mrs. Nolan. What was the surprise your husband had in store for Helen? Well, I... I suppose it might have something to do with his work, with a, a raise, perhaps. Could it possibly have had anything to do with that cottage in the country? Well... Your husband may be in great danger, Mrs. Nolan. You want him back, don't you? 
And Helen's heart is breaking. You're right, Mr. King. I'd give anything in the world to have Jim home again. Perhaps, perhaps I should tell you everything. I think perhaps you should. You see, it was this way. On the first day we were married, Jim would bring his weekly paycheck home to me. We agreed that out of it I'd lay aside five dollars every week to put in the savings bank. And last night, after Helen had left the house, Jim said to me, Well, Mary, I guess you know what my big surprise is. Tomorrow was 20 years to the day when we started our savings account. Tomorrow, Jim? Oh, I I hadn't remembered. I don't wonder, Mary. 20 years. It's been a long time. But now our dream can come true. Together with the interest, there must be over $6,000 in the bank. (laughs) Enough to buy that cottage in the country and a few acres of land to live off of. (laughs) Yep. Tomorrow, I'm quitting my job. Quitting? Hmm? But, Jim, hadn't you better wait just just a while longer? No, Mary, I've made up my mind. Tomorrow, I'm going down to the office and tell them I'm through. Think of it. No more grinding away at the shop. Just green fields, blue skies, and air a man can breathe. But uh, things aren't too easy now, Jim, with expenses so high. Some weeks, I've, well, I've hardly been able to make ends meet. Oh, oh. Uh, is that what you're worried about? Well, I understand, Mary. If we're a few hundred dollars short, that's all right. It's more than that, Jim. More? How much? Answer me. How much? Jim, I didn't realize... Is there 6000 in the bank? Forgive me, Jim. Is there 5000 <laughs> Three? One? Is there anything? <laughs> no... Nothing. Nothing. I didn't know you cared so much, but Jim, let me tell you, I... That's all I've lived for. For the past 20 years. Now, no house. No country. All. All gone. Jim, what are you going to do? Where are you going? I don't know, Mary. I don't know. See, Mr. Keene, I, I couldn't tell Jim the truth for Helen's sake. The truth? How do you mean, Mrs. Nolan? What happened to the money? Well, a few years ago, our daughter Helen developed a very fine singing voice. I spent the money having her voice trained under one of the best teachers in the country. I see. Last night, she had an audition. If Helen wins, it will mean a contract with the Metropolitan Opera. So that's it. But, Mrs. Nolan, you were wrong in not telling Jim the truth. Oh, I realize that now, Mr. King. I was gambling Jim's happiness against Helen's future. And if Helen failed, Jim would never forgive me. Now I'm afraid Jim may have done something. Nothing terrible. <laughs> That's the story, Helen, as your mother told it to me. Poor mother. I never knew. And poor Dad. Oh, Mr. King, we've got to find my father. Yes, Helen, and quickly. But frankly, I... I don't know where to start. I haven't a single clue to go on. That terrible nightmare I had. In it, I saw someone trying to murder my father. I saw it as clearly as I'm seeing you in this room. But that was a dream, Helen, a dream. Uh, Mr. King, sir, if I might make a suggestion... It is just possible. Oh, I know what you're thinking of, Mike. For, for a fact, boss, the great grandmother Gilhooly had second sight. Why, once she had a dream? Yes, and... yes, Mike. I've I've heard such things do happen, but but to look for a lost person on such a basis, why, it's it's fantastic. Dreams are too vague and uncertain. I wouldn't attempt it, oh, Mister Kane. It, it wouldn't do no harm to have the young lady describe it. No, I suppose not. It was so vivid, Mister Kane. Please let me tell you. All right. Go ahead, Helen. Well, I... I suddenly found myself running along what seemed to be a broad wooden platform. I could faintly see a pier in the distance, and and I could hear water lapping up against it. Then as I got closer, I I noticed my father standing uncertainly on the edge, and someone was beside him. There were tracks, and a watchman's shack were between me and the pier. 
I wanted desperately to get to my father, but, but as I started to cross the tracks, I heard a train approaching rapidly. Then the watchman came out of his shack and said, You better hurry, miss, if you're going to make it. Come along, I'll help you. He flashed the train down and with his face grinding up. I need to go the rail car now. Daddy, don't leave me. Come away from there, I beg of you. Suddenly, my father was gone and the other person ran away. And I woke up sobbing wildly. You're very close to your father, aren't you, my dear? Terribly close. Oh, Mr. Keene, doesn't that dream mean anything to you? Don't you believe it shows danger that, that something dreadful has happened to my father? Well, boss, what do you say? Well, Helen, there's, there's just a bare possibility you've been through one of those rare psychic experiences one occasionally reads about. The thousand to one chance. While I've never attempted such a thing before, I propose to look into this dream of yours. Mike? Yes, sir. There's a railroad line running the length of the West Side Riverfront. That's the logical place to begin. Inquire of every shackman's booth along there for any trace of the missing man. In just a moment, we'll hear the outcome of Mr. Keene's search for Jim Nolan. Meanwhile, Cole suffers... At the first sign of a sneeze or other common cold symptoms, take something to help reduce fever if present, something to ease the headache, and something to relieve the pains and aches of a cold. Hill's cold tablets are specially prepared to go after all these symptoms at once. You can rely on Hill's cold tablets because each ingredient in the scientifically compounded cold tablet is of the highest possible quality, a proven formula, famous for more than 50 years. Take only as directed. Ask for Hill's Cold Tablets at your druggist tonight. Now back to Mr. Keene and the Nightmare Murder Case. It's a few hours later, and the tracer is in his office, waiting to hear the results of Mike Clancy's search of the riverfront. His telephone rings. Hello? Is that you, Mr. Keene? Yes, Mike. What's the news? Well, boss, I, I think I've got a lead. It looks like a good one. Fine. Where are you? At the corner of 12th and West Street. Very well, Mike. I'll be there right away. And this, uh, this uh, shackman I told you about, Mr. Keene, he says to me, well, he says, well, here we are, says Hunt. Now, I, I let Tom, that's his name, tell you the story himself. Sir. Very well. Oh, you wait outside, Mike, while I go on in. Right, Bob. Hello, Tom. I'm Mr. Keene. Yes, Mr. Keene. Come on in, sit down. Thank you. I ain't got much style here, but it's a mite warmer than outside. Mike Clancy was telling me what just happened. Yes, I understand you noticed someone early this morning who answered the description of the man we're looking for. That's right. I spied him first about five o'clock. He was hanging around the pier there. The pier, eh? Hmm. Yes. Well, the early mill train comes by here at 5.30. As he was coming down the stretch, I see this here fellow easing towards the tracks. That's funny, thinks I. So I called him to get back, but he took no notice. He acted like a man in a daze. So I flags the train down with my red lantern and pulls him away from the rails, and just in time, too. And then what happened, Tom? Well, I took him into my shack here, Mr. Keene. He didn't look like the usual waterfront hobo, so I asked him what his name is. And what did he say? Well, he says, what's that to you? Jim Jones is good enough. I talked to him for half an hour, kind of quiet-like, but didn't seem to make no kind of impression. He acted real beat down. He did, eh? Yeah. He just couldn't seem to get hold of himself. Kept saying he had no interest in life. Finally, I persuaded him to go and get some sleep. Told him he'd feel better then, and I directed him to a hotel around the corner. A hotel, you say? Yes, sir. Last I saw of him, he was headed that way. Well, thank you, Tom. You've been a real Samaritan. God bless you. This must be the hotel Tom spoke of, Mike. Well, I, I guess we're at the end of the trail, Mr. Keene, and that's fine. Yes. Well, here's the lobby door. Go ahead, boss. 
Hey, Mike, you see what I see? Police and plenty. It looks like trouble, sir. There's Inspector Hopkins. Come on. Hello, Inspector Hopkins. Why, what are you doing here, Mr. King? I might ask the same of you. Well, I'll tell you. It's a little matter of murder. Murder? Yeah. The night clerk was slugged over the head this morning and the safe robbed. Any idea who did it? Oh, sure. This is one murder we don't have to worry about. We just got a confession out of the gunman. Good for you, Inspector. Yeah, Mr. Keene, it's an open and shut case, all right. This gunman was the last one to sign the register before the murder was committed. And he signed it under the name of Jim Jones. Oh? But we broke him down, though. That name is a phony. His real name is Nolan. Nolan? Oh, my, oh, my. Oh, uh, you know him, Mr. Keene? Well, as a matter of fact, we were looking for him for another matter. A little domestic trouble. Oh, well, that sews it up, then. You say that he confessed to this murder? Got it down in black and white. Oh, is that terrible, Mr. Keene? Inspector, what time did the murder take place? The medical examiner has just finished his examination and handed me his report. He says the hotel clerk must have been dead approximately 12 hours. It's now 5.30 in the afternoon, so the murder must have been committed about 5.30 this morning. Yeah. Between 5 and 5.30, the doc says. Not later than 6. Between 5 and 5.30. Inspector, with your permission, I'd like to check on some of the details of this murder. And then I'd like to talk to Jim Nolan. Sure thing, Mr. Keene. This way. Come along, Mike. Boy, if that nightmare ain't coming true, boss, with murder and all the trimmings. Hush, Mike. All right, Mr. Keene, you've seen the death clerk's body. Now, do you want to have a talk with Nolan? Yes, Inspector. I'd like to see what I can get out of him. Well, he's right in here, Mr. Keene. Oh, uh, Nolan, if someone wants to talk to you. Hello, Jim. I'm glad to see you. My name is Keene. Keene, you say? What do you want? I've been sent for your wife and daughter to look for you. I haven't any wife and daughter. No. The inspector tells me you've confessed to killing the hotel clerk. Sure, I confessed. Why don't you fellas let me alone? I've told you I did it, so let's get it over with. The sooner the better. Do you want to die, Jim? Is there any reason why I should want to live? I can think of two reasons. Mary and Helen. I don't know what you're talking about. Inspector. Yes, Mr. King? I have an idea. Have you had this man view the body of the victim? Why, no, it wasn't necessary, Mr. King. All right. Jim, there's one question I want to ask you, and then I won't bother you anymore. Can you give me a description of the hotel clerk who was on duty when you registered this morning? The man you say you killed. Haven't you enough evidence against me? Yes, but this will clinch it. Well, he was stocky, had black hair, a pug nose, and the little finger on his right hand was missing. I noticed the finger especially. You're sure of that? Positive. Oh, uh, Mr. King, just a minute. That ain't what the dead man looks like at all. Of course not. That's a perfect description of Bugs Morelli, the safe cracker. Why, sure. That mug we've been out gunning for for some time, eh, Mr. King? Right. Morelli's your man, Inspector. Jim Nolan never committed this crime. Yeah, but how... Uh... Let me suggest what happened. Bugs held up the hotel desk clerk and then blackjacked him. While he was in the act of breaking open the safe, Nolan entered the hotel. To allay suspicion, Bugs then posed as the real clerk and assigned him to a room. But then, why did Nolan here confess he murdered the clerk? Well, that's another story. Jim Nolan has had a great shock. At the moment, he is desperate. He just doesn't want to live and... And having failed in an attempt to kill himself, he thought he saw in this another way out. Well, it, it sounds crazy, Mr. King, but it looks as if you might be right. I'm sure of it, Inspector. With your permission, I'll take Jim Nolan along home. Go right ahead, Mr. King. That is, if you'll promise to have him on hand if I need him as a witness. I give you my word on it. that way. Of course you're going home. I can't face them, Mr. Keene. Why not? You haven't been guilty of any crime. You've acted a little foolishly, I think. But then so is Mary, your wife. With our dreams, they've all gone sour. 
Our cottage has turned out to be just a house of cards. What have I to live for? Jim, you're like a little boy who's lost his ice cream cone and thinks the world has come to an end. All of us have our dreams of one kind or another. Many are feathery and golden ones, just like yours. Why, we couldn't exist without them. But sometimes we have to sacrifice our hopes to help others attain theirs. And that's what's happened in your case. What do you mean, Mr. King? Mary didn't spend your savings, as you thought, for selfish reasons. She spent them on Helen. Helen? Yes. Your daughter has a fine singing voice. Something you didn't realize, Jim. Mary wanted to give her the best musical education that money could buy. But if she'd only told me... Well, that's where she was wrong. She was afraid. Afraid you might not understand. And afraid if Helen knew the circumstances, she'd refuse to continue her studies. So that's the way it was. Yes. Jim, I... I believe you're going to have reason to be very proud of Helen. Well, here we are. Home. Yes. Home. That has a wonderful sound, hasn't it? Yes, Mr. Keene. It has. Mary. Jim. Oh, Jim, thank God you're home again. Helen, he's back. Daddy's back. Oh, Dad, I'm so happy. If you only knew how we've worried about you. Ah, there, there, <laughs> Helen. It's all right. Oh, Jim, it was all my fault. Can you ever forgive me? Ah, don't worry, Mary. Mr. Keene explained everything. I, I guess I was a little foolish, too. You did exactly right about Helen. How can we ever thank you, Mr. Keene? Oh, yes, how can we? Don't try, my dears. My reward is in seeing you all so happily reunited. But, Mr. Keene, I still don't understand. How did you manage to trace me? Well, it's a strange story. Strange and incomprehensible. Helen had a vivid dream about you last night. She dreamed you were in great danger. And from the misty gropings of her mind, she saw almost an exact duplicate of the spot where you were standing. By following this lead, I was able to pick up your trail. That's amazing, Mr. Keene. And I've never been one to put any stock in dreams at all. No, I never did either. But it is an amazing coincidence. Suppose we call it just that. Now I I must be going. Oh, wait, Mr. Keene. Helen has something to tell you. I won that audition, Mr. Keene. You won that audition? Good for you. And a contract to sing at the Metropolitan next year. Helen. Oh, Daddy, I'm so happy. Helen, darling, it's... It all seems so wonderful. I, I can hardly realize what it means. I think it means, Jim, that you're going to have that cottage in the country after all. a shock to meet someone whose nice appearance is suddenly shattered by a smile that reveals dull, dingy-looking teeth, or whose breath is unwelcome. Because many people are hampered by both of these handicaps without even knowing they have them, it pays to know about Colonel's toothpaste. To help correct these conditions when caused by improper cleansing, just brush your teeth with Colonel, as you would with any other toothpaste, with this one exception. When you finish brushing... Swish its rich, active foam thoroughly through your mouth. For Colonos is one toothpaste with a mouthwash effect built right in. Thus, it fosters a double result. First, Colonos helps your brush remove ugly surface stains from your teeth. Then, at the same time, it freshens your breath while you're brushing your teeth. For a high-polishing, high-forming toothpaste with a mouthwash effect built right in, ask for Colonos. It has been approved by thousands of dentists. If powder is your preference, try Colonel's Tooth Powder. It offers the same double result as a wonderful wintergreen flavor. Get K-O-L-Y-N-O-S, toothpaste or tooth powder. Tomorrow, buy Colonel. You've been listening.
listening to Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. On the air every Thursday at this time. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday when the kindly old Tracer brings us another thrilling missing persons case. Gleaming floors in record time. Yes, no rubbing Arawax goes on quickly, dries in minutes, lasts for weeks. It polishes floors with sparkling luster that makes rooms lovelier and saves frequent scrubbing. Only 25 cents a pint at any leading store. Get Arawax, A-E-R-O-W-A-X, tomorrow. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, will be on the air next Thursday at the same time. This is Larry Elliott saying goodbye for Mr. Keene and the Whitehall Pharmacal Company, makers of Colonel's Toothpaste and Tooth Powder. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. There's one chap around who never fails to electrify you. He sure can turn it on and turn it off. Am I referring to the state executioner, I wonder? The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Craig speaking. A confidential cop enjoys a certain public popularity. He gets haberdashers' circulars in the mail, anonymous threatening letters scented with perfume, and he gets invited to parties. A fancy shindig is thrown somewhere, a special invitation is tossed at ye cop, and no RSVP to it. The host wants you so badly, he comes your way to invite you in person. My would-be host in this one was Badger Boris, the sort of guy newspaper society columns called a, a bon vivant in French. Bon vivant meaning Boris slept all day and stayed up all night. And when the cabbage got thin, all he had to do was go to the bank. The short, moon-faced guy who looked like a cherub weaned on uh, pasteurized champagne. You will, of course, be paid handsomely, Mr. Craig. Paid yet for coming to your big blowout. Mm-hmm. Now I'm really overwhelmed. Stand aside for a body fall. Then you agree to come. After you give me the other inducements. Well, fine foods. I've ordered 200 pounds of buffalo steak. What do I wash it down with? A liqueur qui set. What's that? A Mohammedan beverage. I had it specially flown here from Istanbul. What's for dessert? Raisin cake. Uh, a plebeian touch to offset the noxious effects of a too rich repast. Rich? I just felt the whack of that word. How prosperous will I be going home in the early a.m.? Your fee will be $1,000. Money flown in from Istanbul? Oh, no. American money. I'm your slave, Saeed. (laughs) Sketch out the requirements of my assignment now. I'm giving an intimate costume party for certain selected friends. A masquerade, you understand. You've perhaps read about other famous parties I've given in the past. Who hasn't? Your parties generally make the front pages and uh, the police blotter. Brawls. They always break up in bloody brawls. You are unfortunately accurate. Uh, You will circulate with the guests. And when you sense that any of them are becoming uh, too disputatious... Too hotted up. You will then exercise a tranquilizing influence. Exactly what do I do there? Well, strictly entre nous. A blow shrewdly delivered to uh, the stomach, say, where the damage cannot be seen. I don't want a lawsuit against me. Where do I cart the horizontal guest? After I stiffen him. I have an emergency room set aside. You'll find bandages, smelling salts, and restoratives in it. Well, that's my job. Bouncer with kid gloves. And a tuxedo. You must wear a tuxedo. Uh, And, of course, a mask. You were an honored guest, too. Oh, and uh, one other small chore. Don't tell me. Dilettantes, you said. On my side of the street, we call them deadbeats and freeloaders. They live piling up IOUs. 
A party sidelined with them sometimes is palming somebody's jewels or wallet. Yes. Uh, you will prevent any theft. I don't want that disgrace. Uh, well, are we agreed? Uh, one item remains. I'll need ten dollars on account. On account of I've got to rent a tux. <laughs> I attended the party wearing a straitjacket, the tuxedo, a mask, and a noose around my neck. That would be the black bow tie. An intimate crowd like Badger Boris had promised. Everybody in costume and mask. And all of them milling around the food and drink, and each other. I got up on a balcony for a better view of the menagerie. Up on the balcony with me was a society photographer. A guy in striped pants who looked like an unemployed diplomat. He was taking flashbulb pictures. I watched him until I felt a hot breath on my neck. Mr. Craig. Oh, how are you, boss? Call me Mr. Boris, please. I dislike informality. Uh, you've got a problem? Uh, this is the wrong station for you here on the balcony. It is? I don't like you looking down on my guests. I'm not. They're looking up to me. Uh, mingling with them, you can overhear and anticipate. They prevent any disorder by forestalling it. Okay, I'll get down off my perch. Besides, the ladies below resent the standoffish male. You must dance with them and flatter them and be witty. Witty? Say, can you tell me a few fast jokes? I got down and mingled. I wrestled through a few dances with a lady who had one stomach in front of her and one in reserve. She was costumed as a witch and wore a pink mask. You dance beautifully, Mr. Uh... Uh-uh. No name dropping. Everybody's incognito until midnight. That's how Boris wants it. Uh, this, uh, step I'm doing, lady, uh... Yes? It's a one step. My grandfather had no further use for it, so he... He gave it to me. <laughs> I love being gay. Oh, do you, my potted flower? <laughs> you wit. It is a sharp rapier's rust. Ah, don't let me slice off too much of your funny bone now. Uh, shall we trip it over to the punch bowl? No. I prefer this intoxication. Your strong arm. My barking dogs. Lady, uh, once more around, I'll, I'll need an oxygen tent. Why, you are unusually winded. All right, you rest somewhere. My headdress is awry. I'll go repair it. Godspeed and amen. We'll meet out on the patio in five minutes? Oh, 20, 20. I, I don't want to overdo this. In 20 minutes. It'll be midnight then. We'll unmask together. A rendezvous on the patio. Two alone under the moon. Me and an oversized dame dying to kick me around for kicks. Ah, uh, earning a living sure came hard. Midnight happened uh, like it usually does. I sneaked off to look for my witch on the patio. Patio was sleek flagstone with a floral display on it, like a high-class funeral parlor. It was a moon that had a bloodshot look to it, as if it didn't sleep days. It was a small wind that poets and advertising copywriters like to call zephyrs. I found my bewitching witch on a love seat swing made out of wrought iron. She had her arms outstretched, like a snake about to give you constrictions. The rest of her was in a sprawl. When I reached her, my worries ceased. She wasn't being amorous. She was asleep as if she'd passed out. Two seconds later, I changed my diagnosis. She was in another condition altogether. She was defunct, dead. There was blood all over her costume, like she'd been stabbed over the heart by a knife or a dagger. But the weapon wasn't around. At least I couldn't see it. But then the way the situation stacked up, I had eyes only for the corpse. <laughs> I conducted some post-mortems with my client, Badger Boris. I checked over his guest list. Twelve guests. Is that the net count, Boris? Yes, uh, twelve excluding you, Mr. Craig. But then you weren't really a guest. Who was the murder victim? Cora Wilmer. Cora Wilmer. Let me see. I don't find her name on your guest list. How come? Cora Wilmer, um, the late Cora Wilmer, I mean, crashed the party. Symbolically enough, she was the thirteenth guest. Tell me about Cora. Gross, foolish, and very rich. A middle-aged matron, miserably in quest of the elixir of youth. Chop it up. Cora was 50. She affected the mannerisms of 20. That sounds like a young husband in the picture she was trying to keep up with. Astute of you. Yes, there was a younger husband. 
a bit player in theatricals whose dream is to play Hamlet, the melancholy Dane. Was he here tonight? You have the guest list. Yeah. Mark Wilmer. What costume was he wearing? I've already given you a clue. Hamlet, the melancholy Great Dane. How did Cora and Mark feel about each other, or don't you know? I would venture that they despised each other. May and December, Mr. Craig. The seasons are inimical and antithetical. You keep clobbering me with words. Call Mark Wilmer in here for a little questioning. I can't. He's gone home. I gave orders. Nobody leaves. (laughs) Mark Wilmer or any of my guests don't respond to orders, as you will discover. Call a crash, you say. But Mark was an invited guest. Then who came coupled with Mark? The Queen of Sheba. Yeah, I saw the costume. A dish in harem silk with a ruby glued to her forehead. Who is she on this guest list? Uh, Rita Romaine. A heat wave? Yes, if you must express it so commonly. She was the poster girl for the Inter-Allied Fruit Pickers Convention last year. Boat manufacturers proclaimed her Miss Cabin Cruiser of 1953. And Mark nominated her to be Queen Empress of his heart, soul, and liver. You're trying awfully hard to supply me with a motive, Boris. Am I? And I thought I was being so ingeniously subtle. A May-December marriage that ended in divorce by murder and a doll who won the hearts of married men. I hurried over to the Wilmer house. There was a wind nipping it up, the parlor floor lights were on brightly, and a piano was going. A late hour, kind of, for a piano. It was 4 a.m., I decided not to announce myself. Instead, I crossed the big lawn and found a station just outside the big French window. There was a hard-looking character inside, standing over the pianist. He had the look of a private eye. I made that guess anyhow. I also guessed the pianist to be the new widower, Mark Wilmer. I got an earful. Uh, Wilmer. Yes? You're ignoring me, Sonny. You got lost in Beethoven. List. I'm playing list. Now let's start playing truth or consequences, huh? I hear I lost a rich client. Yes, you have. Corey's dead. But you have a new client now. It's you. Yes, me. Hmm. Sounds like you're trying to bribe me. I'll be accused of it. They'll say I murdered my wife for her money. Money and how? A lot of loot falls into your lap. They'll say I did it to be free to marry Rita Romaine. That I was secretly in love with Rita. Which you are, Sonny. They'll subpoena Gurko, a private detective, and put him on the witness stand. And I'll testify the late Cora Wilma hired me on the QT. I was to check with her once every 24 hours and see if she was still alive. She was that scared. Cora pretended her fear to humiliate me. I've got other facts, Sonny, in my little notebook. I read this off to the court. Uh... February 16th at 10 p.m., the defendant, Mark Wilmer, attempted strangling his wife, Cora. A Dr. Enright treated her for throat bruises and shot. Cora baited me into assaulting her, to hold a weapon over me, to keep me from ever leaving her. Maybe, but who'll believe you? That's why you're working for me now. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. You know, what you're asking is a lot, Sonny. I got a big investment in my license. A lot of loot falls into my lap. How much do you like money, Gurko? Oh, who doesn't like money? The, uh, bribe has to come pretty high for me to be tempted to forget my duty. It will be high. Even higher than your dreams, Gurko. The big bribe. Offer and acceptance. Some husbands had their own tender way of mourning the dead. I'd really gotten an earful. When the private-eyed Gurko had wrapped up his deal and scrammed, I walked in through the big French windows and introduced myself to Mark Wilmer. Police persecution is beginning early. Early? Your wife's very cold. She's been dead a uh, hundred years. I don't like your informal entrance, Mr. Craig. Next murder, I'll come down the chimney. How long... How long have you been outside those windows? How long? Oh, I only just arrived. Now, that's a funny question. Please get your business over with. I'm dog-tired and verging on collapse. The $64 question. Answer it for me. 
I did not murder Cora Wilmer. You had motive to. Your marriage wasn't too uh, divine. There was another woman in your life. We had certain incompatibilities, my wife Cora and I. But we reconciled them tonight. We made peace with each other, patched things up, decided to give ourselves another try. But you escorted Rita Romaine to Boris's party. That's untrue. I went to Boris's with my wife. I found Miss Romaine there. That's your story. That's the truth. Boris says otherwise. Why would Boris lie? Ask Boris. I will. What made you reconcile with a wife you obviously, uh, will say, disliked? <laughs> Futility. Cora couldn't be discarded decently in an adult way. She had a way of insinuating herself, taking hold and holding on. I couldn't stand up to the war against her. It was too, too wearing, too morbid. I realized that and gave up trying to win my freedom from her. You gave up Rita Romaine? I gave up dreaming. But now with your wife uh, conveniently dead? My personal situation isn't improved, it's worse. You mean jail? I mean jail. Not if you're innocent of murder. That won't matter. I'll deny it, but I'll be condemned. The outlook is very black. I married for money, that's a count against me. I had violent scenes with my wife. I loved another woman. That will hang me. Pretty fatalistic outlook. I'm a realist. Hard luck has dogged me since I can remember. I'm never on top of a life situation. I've lived my life without a laugh, without a light moment. I'll cry the day after tomorrow. You were Hamlet in costume at tonight's party. Yes, I was. If you like. Here it is. The belt around the waist with the scabbard attached. What about it? The scabbard is empty. Where's the dagger that goes with it? Dagger? I didn't know that there was it. Was that how Cora was murdered? A dagger into the heart. Oh. I told you I'd deny it, but I'd be condemned anyhow. A missing dagger in my costume. It's typical of my luck. Then you won't try to explain it? I can't explain it, Mr. Craig. I can't explain it because I simply don't know. <laughs> Back to William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig in just a moment. And now, back to William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. A guy on the edge of becoming delirious, you leave him for another day, a calmer time. Besides, I needed sleep myself. I got into my car... I just pulled away from the curb when I got noticed that sleep was going to be a missing ingredient in my future. A try at murder number two. Yours truly, the victim. I drove around the block and around again with my headlights out, watching for a car somewhere to come to life, start up and show the glow of its taillight. My car was the only way the rifleman could quit the area. The area was suburban, way off of the main hub. No taxis, no bus lines, and it was 4 a.m. Somebody had to try and escape by an automobile parked somewhere in the vicinity. All I had to do was cruise around and watch and hope. When I saw it, I saw the taillight first. A car starting up a half block away, pulling away from the curb. I raced over to it. I cut across its path, trapping it. A lady motorist took offense at what I'd done. Mister, you're in my way. That was the understatement of the century. I got out to go hunt for a rifle. Sorry to be so melodramatic, miss. Uh, uh, Romaine, isn't it? Yes. How did you know my name? Search me. It was the first name that popped into my head. I want to look in the back of your car, beautiful. You have no right. Don't please overplay the indignation, doll. I'm a detective. I'm at work. Well, I don't find it. Find what? A rifle used on me a little while ago. Oh, this whole thing is absurd. Yes, isn't it? I'd apologize, only I found something even more exciting than a rifle. You found something? Right on the back seat, wedged into a cushion. A dagger, beautiful. More specifically, a bloodstained dagger. <laughs> we kept company, the Queen of Sheba and me, in a roadside diner. 
We split a gallon of black coffee down the middle while she poured out her sad tale. I tell you, I don't know how to explain that dagger, Mr. Craig. Mr. Craig? It's too early in the morning for stiff formality. Very. What were you doing parked down the street from the Wilma place? I was going to see Mark. How he was. Just outside, starting up his walk, I thought better of it. It looked too compromising at that hour. I changed my mind. I went back to my car. You went to see Mark Wilma hardly two hours after the murder of his wife? Yes, I know it was terribly foolish, but I've never made a secret of my feeling for Mark. So confess it to me. I'm desperately in love with him. It's not so shameful as it seems. You see, I knew Mark first, before Cora did. We were engaged to be married. We had wonderful plans. Mark was afraid of our poverty. We were surely defeated because of the desperate lack of money, he said. Our marriage could not succeed. Kept adding postponement, postponement, until... Until... Until Cora happened along. <laughs> Rich, possessive. She played on Mark's weakness. His insecurity is his overvalue of money. She bought him. Mark never really broke our engagement. He just eloped with Cora. Why would your recent party host, Badger Boris, try to throw suspicion on Mark? To hurt me, through Mark. Boris, well, he fancies me. I've laughed at his advances, turned down his proposals of marriage, but Boris doesn't forget, or even forgive. He harbors grudges. He's a horribly twisted egotist. Did you go to the party with Mark Wilma? No, I came alone. Mark came with Cora. And Boris did lie to me. I now have three capital suspects. Three suspects? Mark, wanting out of his marriage, out with profit. You to get rid of a rival who'd stolen your dearly beloved. And now Badger Boris to beat you over the head by framing the man you love. Now, let's go, doll. I'm under arrest? House custody. Your own house, this is. The dagger was too conveniently where I could find it. I don't think you could be that careless about a murder weapon. Or could you? <laughs> While catching a snooze on my office chair, a visitor barged in. The private eye, Gurko, just a little tipsy, like he'd been celebrating something. Celebrating his windfall was my idea, but I wasn't saying it aloud. Barry Craig? None other than. Well, hello, colleague. Gurko's the name. I'm a private dick like you. The assumption is debatable. I don't get the crack. It's a delicate question of morals, but skip it. What brings you staggering? I'm here to say my piece about Mark Wilmer. So say it. Wilmer is an okay guy. He's a good, upstanding man, I want you to know. And very rich. That is, if he beats the electric chair. I investigated Wilmer, turned him inside out. Not a spot on him, not a blemish. The boy can look the world square in the eye. Goodbye. I'm not finished. You are. It's either out the door or throw it. Ah, oh, you're unsocial. I don't like investigators who talk glibly in their own cause. Out. You know something? You're nuts. Now, why did I come talk to a nut? The way I keep knocking myself out defending people. I got Boris on the phone. Hello? Boris, this is Barry Craig speaking. Oh, you woke me up. It's noon. Time to rise and shine. What do you want? Those party photographs I saw being taken last night. I want them. Why? Well, a lot of reasons. One of them is, uh, I want to see if Mark Wilma wore a dagger in the scabbard on his costume. I'm afraid I must disappoint you. Meaning? I destroyed the pictures. Come again? The party was such a distressing bore, Mr. Craig. Hardly worth the sentimental or memorial of pictures. I dislike preserving dismal memories, so I destroyed the pictures. Do you find me eccentric? Only phony. Phony is a nine-dollar bill. Goodbye. I stopped in to see Badger Boris personally, without appointment. You have no business molesting me. I know. Home is your castle. The pictures or the negatives. I want them, Boris. But I told you I destroyed them. Yeah, you told me. The memory of last night is acid in your soul. So why preserve it? Cute ad lib. You've got a genius for evasion. Now come across. I'll have you thrown out of here. 
We'll hit the sidewalk together. We'll ride downtown arm in arm. So close because we're handcuffed together. Let's uh, measure your wrist for size. You, you, you would dare handcuff me? And arrest you. Suspicion of murder. You're sure going to look elegant penned up with a rabble. Well? Well, you argue resourcefully. You've uncovered my one weak spot. I am allergic to odors. I could never tolerate the reek of your prison rabble. The negatives, you'll find them in that cabinet there. The bottom drawer. Take them and go. I'll take them and go after you write a check for $1,000. My agreed fee for last night's rhubarb. <laughs> Don't look so pained, host. I had the negatives developed. Eight rolls of them. I had them developed with a prayer. A prayer that my hunch on the film would pay off. When I got a look at the developed pictures, I went traveling. Downtown to a Park Row office with a shingle on it that read the Gurko Agency. I let myself in with a skeleton key to wait for Gurko. I wanted to surprise Gurko with a bang. Gurko rolled in at the stroke of three. I waited until his head showed. Then I came down on the target. Oh, When he came to enough to stare up at me groggily, we got down to cases. You slugged me, Craig. Why? A uh, precaution to take the fright out of you. I checked into your background a bit. What you did before you became a blackmailing shamus. You were a champ boxer, runner-up for the light heavyweight title. I didn't relish coming to blows with you. I want my nose looking exactly like it looks. What's your play? An arrest. I'm arresting you for blackmail and murder. I said you were a nut. I developed rolls of film taken at Boris's costume party. Mark Wilmer never carried a dagger in a scabbard. I've got pictures covering the whole evening. No dagger ever in Mark Wilmer's costume. So what? Boris's guest list totaled 12, so Boris said. Boris was faking. It was actually 13, officially. He wanted me to think Cora Wilmer crashed the party and that Mark Wilmer came with Rita. All over my head, Craig. Try getting up, I'll crack down on you. I've got pictures showing that there was even more than 13 guests. That's excluding me. On one picture, I count 14. 14 guests. The 14th was the murderer. Boris knew it, but he tried to cover it up. Not that he wanted to spare you, Gurko, but because he preferred seeing Mark Wilmer take the rap. He hoped to frame Mark. Your turn to talk. Craig, what kind of guy are you? Try me out. That's better. <laughs> I didn't figure you'd be an angel. I didn't see any wings. Fifty-fifty. We'll split a fortune. If I shut up about your murdering your own client, Cora Wilmer, so you could blackmail her widowed husband? Yeah, yeah, that was the play. Mark was a frightened pigeon. Forget Cora, Craig. Nobody cried when she died. It comes out fine for everybody. Mark and the doll, Rita, they get married. They got dough. And you and me, we got dough. It still needs a fall guy. Boris, we'll pin it on Boris. We'll switch it around. Boris was out to frame a guy he hated, Mark Wilmer. I'll think up a way. Like you planted the dagger and Rita's car? Well, I did that to confuse things. Take some of the heat off Mark. And that rifle shot at me? Well, that was to scare you away. Only that. Hang the frame on Boris. Make him the fall guy. I think I know a way, Craig. Don't pick your brains too hard. The little gray matter you've got, Gurko, concentrate on how you can beat the electric chair. Oh. It's like that, eh? You suck at me. No deal. You're turning me in, huh? That's right. Why? I could say for the honor of the profession, colleague. But, uh, that would be corny, wouldn't it? You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator.
See what you're complaining about, John? Oh, you don't, huh? Well, who owns this pawn shop, Paul? You, me, or both of us? We both do, you know that. Okay, then. From now on, I sign checks the same as you do. Now, wait a minute, John. You're getting your share of the profits, aren't you? So you say. Only I don't trust you. I'll get it. Hello. Hello. Wait a minute, this. Is anybody on here? Hello. Hello. Is this Blaine's pawn shop? Yeah, what do you want? Uh, I want to speak to Paul Blaine, please. Oh, you don't care who you speak to, do you? Just a minute. It's for you here. Thanks. Hello? Hello, Paul Blaine? Yeah? This is Boston Blackie. Uh, you wanted me to call you? Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm sorry about the way my brother spoke to you on the phone. We're having a little argument. That's all right. Uh, what do you want, Blaine? I'd, I'd like to see you. It's important and... Uh, well, could you get down here this afternoon? Well, I don't know. I... Uh, no, look, you got to come. It's awfully important. All right, Blaine. I'll be there about 3 o'clock. Okay, 3 o'clock. Uh, thanks. Goodbye. Hey, what kind of a deal you got cooking with Blackie, Paul? That's my own business. Now, look, John, I don't want any more trouble with you or... Oh, no, well, you're going to get it. Now, wait a minute, John. Don't leave. Stop worrying about my leaving. But just start worrying if I come back. <laughs> And now, back to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friends. Oh, there's the pawn shop we want. Two doors down, Mary. Oh, yeah. Why did Paul Blaine want to see you, Blackie? I don't know, Mary. That's what I've come down here to find out. Well, that being the case, let's go in and find out. Here we are. Oh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Are you Paul Blaine? Yes, I am. You must be Boston Blackie. Yes, and this is Mary Wesley. How, How do you do, do? Mr. Blaine? Well, you're right on time, Blackie. You said you'd be here at three, and it's, well, two minutes of three right now. I'm generally on time, Blaine. What'd you want to see me about? Well, it's this, Blackie. I made a loan of $1,000 on a diamond yesterday, and this morning I found out it's stolen property. Uh-oh. That's bad, isn't it? It's very bad, Miss Wesley. It means I may lose my $1,000. Ooh. Well, what do you want me to do about it, Blaine? Well, I... I thought you'd take the diamond to the insurance company that carries a policy on it and make a deal so I could get my money back. Oh. Well, I suppose I could do that, but why can't you? Well, they'd have no reason to bargain with me. They'd know I'd have to turn in the diamond to the police. And Well, I was hoping it wouldn't be too much trouble for oh, you to... Oh, Blackie's uh... so used to trouble, he's lonesome without it. Quiet, Mary. All right, but uh, I like that. That's what I like, modesty. Mm-hmm. All right, Blaine. I'll take the diamond. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Here, I have it here in my pocket. Okay, Ooh. Blaine. You'll hear from me tomorrow. Uh, about what time, Blackie? Mm, same time as now, 3 o'clock. Come on, Mary. Uh, okay. okay, see you at 3 tomorrow, Blackie. Goodbye and thanks. Goodbye and don't mention it. Let's wait here for care, Mary. All right. Blackie, will you be able to get Mr. Blaine's $1,000 back? I think so, Mary. All I have to do is... That was a shot! And inside the store, too. Come on. Blaine! Blaine, where... Oh, there he is. Blackie, it's... Oh. Oh, it, it looks like he's... Dead, Mary. Ooh. He has to be dead unless he was wearing a bulletproof heart. Yes, but, but who could have... I don't know. But whoever it was is probably out the back way by now. Well, here we go again. I guess I'd better call Faraday. No, darling, no. Please don't call Inspector Faraday. You didn't have anything to do with this, but Faraday will never believe you. All right, Mary, I guess the best way for us to stay out of this is to get out of here. Hey, Rollins! Rollins, come in my office! Yeah, Inspector Faraday? What about some action on the murder of Paul Blaine, the pawnbroker? Inspector, there hasn't been a thing developed. Just a minute. Faraday speaking. Inspector, got a little news for you. You want to know who killed Paul Blaine, don't you? Sure. Do you know who did it? Well, I know who was in his store about the time he got bumped. Who? Oh. friend of yours, Boston Blackie. A friend of it? Bo- Hello. 
Hello. Hey, what was it, Inspector? Some guy who says Boston Blackie was at the scene of Paul Blaine's murder. Good. Hey, that's exactly what you want, isn't it? It should be, but it isn't. This is one time I don't think Blackie's involved. And besides, I waste too much time chasing that guy anyway. Gee, Inspector, you must be sick. Maybe that call was a straight tip. I doubt it. Besides, I got a line on Blaine's killer. Yeah, who? Never mind who. But Blaine sent a certain guy to prison about five years ago. Last week, that certain guy got out of prison. I think he killed Blaine for revenge. Could be, Inspector, but I'd still like to have a look around Blackie's apartment. Go ahead. Waste your time any way you want. But I'll bet I find a real killer before you find anything on Boston Blackie. <laughs> Harry, what's the matter? Uh, uh, nothing, nothing, Helen. Something is, honey. You seem awfully upset. What is the matter? You read the paper you brought me? Only the headlines. I don't remember what they said, though. Well, uh, let me refresh your memory just a little. Mm-hmm. Yeah, listen to this headline. Huh. Cops looking for ex-convict and Blaine murder. Oh, yes, I remember that. Well, I'm an ex-con, remember that? Yes, of course, darling. You got out of jail. Let's see. It was last, uh... Uh, what day was it? Last Friday. Oh, yes, that's right. But, darling, what does this have to do with you and then this Mr. Blaine's murder? Well, Blaine sent me to prison. Now the cops are trying to tie me up with his murder. Oh. Hmm. The paper says Blaine was knocked off at 3 o'clock yesterday. If I could just remember where I was then, I... Don't you know where you were, Harry? You were with me. Oh, yeah, yeah, but where? Uh, we weren't anywhere. We were out walking, that's all. Oh, yes, that's right. Where were we walking? Do you remember? Oh, not exactly. Downtown somewhere. Hmm. No, I've got to keep you out of this. I think I know what I'm going to do. What? I'm going to see a fellow named Boston Blackie. He helps guys like me. Well, you can't leave here if the police are looking for you. Harry, I've met Blackie's friend, Mary Wesley. I know her. I'll get her to help me, and she'll get Blackie to help you. Now, Helen, please, can't you remember where you and Harry were, and and at least about what time it was? No, Mary, I can't. All I know is, is that we were out walking. Yes, but where, dear? Just downtown. That's a big help. Now, look. Paul Blaine was murdered at 3 o'clock in his shop on 71st Street. Were you on 71st Street around 3 o'clock? Well, no. Oh, gosh, I'm beginning to sound like Blackie. Mary, I don't know where we were. I started out to see a man about fixing my coat. I think I have his address here in my purse. Oh, well, this might be something. Oh, dear. Oh, yes. Here's his address. 20th Street. All right, now you think you were on 20th Street? Yes. Down there somewhere. But I don't know. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What's that other card in your purse? Where? Which one? Oh, yes, it's this. Oh, yes, I remember. A sidewalk photographer took our picture and gave us this check. Yesterday? Yes, while we were out walking. Yesterday afternoon. Hmm. Well, as Blackie might say when I show him this, it's a nice photograph. Let's hope it doesn't result in any negative development. <laughs> Faraday speaking. Inspector Faraday, this is Rawlins. I'm calling from Blackie's apartment. And guess what I found? Guess. Guess? What am I? A guest star? What was it? A diamond. So what? Well, this diamond is listed as one of the things which should have been in Paul Blaine's pawn shop, but wasn't. Yeah? Yeah. And that means maybe Blackie was... Well, he, uh... He, uh, might have... Uh... What are you talking about? Well, uh, you see, uh... <laughs> I get it. Blackie slipped up behind you and has a gun in your back, huh? <laughs> Some cop you are. Well, just put Blackie on the phone. Sure. Here, Blackie, he wants to talk to you. <laughs> Thanks, Rollins. And uh, don't go away yet. Okay. Hello, Inspector. Blackie, what is that diamond from Blaine's pawn shop doing in your apartment? It's all very simple, Inspector, but it'll sound complicated to you. Blaine gave it to me. Oh, yeah? When? At 3 o'clock yesterday afternoon. 3 o'clock? That's when we think he was killed. And I got to tip you were there when it happened. Only I didn't believe it. Why not? I was there. A few minutes before and after the murder. What? And you didn't report it? No, Faraday. And you know why, too. 
It meant getting mixed up in this, which is something I didn't want to do. I didn't believe the tip I got. And I'll tell you something you won't believe. What? I believe you. How do you like that? Faraday, my, how you've changed. Uh, never mind about me. You sent Rollins back to headquarters. And with that diamond. All right. Bye. Goodbye. Rollins. Yeah, Blackie? Faraday wants you back at headquarters, and you can take this diamond with you. Sure. Okay, thanks a lot, Blackie. Good, uh... Oh, hello, Miss Wesley. Hello, Sergeant Rollins. Come in, Mary. The sergeant is just leaving. Yes, yeah, so long. Bye. Well, Mary, I almost got mixed up in the Blaine murder. Rollins found that diamond Blaine gave me, and Faraday got a tip I was there when Blaine was killed. Oh, somebody's trying to frame you. Well, that means you'll help my friend Helen, doesn't it? What? What friend Helen? Helen Waltham, darling. The one I told you about on the telephone. Faraday thinks her fiancé, Harry Matthews, murdered Blaine. Oh. Oh, yes. Well, that means I... I'd better find an alibi for Matthews that will show him away from the scene of the crime at the time of the murder. Well, all right, then. I know this much, Blackie. Yesterday afternoon, Helen and Harry were walking on 20th Street. Now, that's about five miles from the scene of the crime. A sidewalk photographer took their picture. She thinks about three o'clock, and she had a receipt for it. I took that. Here. Picture, huh? Say, I'd like to see it. Maybe the shadows on the street or something on it would give Matthews an alibi. Yeah. It's awfully late. Photoshop is probably closed by now. But if we can get into the dark room, maybe we can bring an alibi for Matthews out into the light. How soon will the picture be developed, Blackie? Should be about now, Mary. I've had the print and the solution about... Uh... Oh, I'm beginning to see something now. Good. I'm glad you took this claim check from Helen so we could find this picture. Hmm. Without being that print isn't taking as long as it took us to get in here. That was a tough lock on mm-hmm. the door, Mary. I had a hard time picking it. Yeah, you'll have to buy the photographer a new lock, won't you? <laughs> I suppose so. Now let's hope this picture shows something that'll help us. All we know now is that it was taken the afternoon of the murder. Okay, I'm hoping. Look, Blackie, there's the whole picture now. It's clear, too. Mm-hmm. Now we'll lift it out of the solution and have a look at it. Here, I'll put it on the table here and hold it down with these weights so it won't curl while it dries. There. Well, it shows Helen and her friend Matthews, all right. Look behind Helen and our boyfriend, Mary. The Leeds Jewelry Store clock and look at the time. Three o'clock. And Leeds Jewelry Store is on 20th Street, a good five miles from where Paul Blaine was killed. And at three o'clock. Tell your friend Helen not to worry, Mary. Our friend Harry Matthews is all right. The clear shot of the clock in this picture put him in the clear, too. Now, back to Boston Blackie. Paul Blaine, pawnbroker, gets Blackie's help in returning a stolen diamond. Just after Blackie leaves him, however, Blaine is shot and killed. Police think Blaine was murdered by Harry Matthews, ex-con, who was sent to jail by Blaine. But with the help of his girlfriend, Helen Waltham, Matthews receives Blackie's help in proving his innocence. Blackie finds a sidewalk photographer's picture of Matthews near the Leeds jewelry store, five miles away from the murder scene, with the hands of the clock at three, which is the time Blaine was killed. So Matthews is obviously innocent. As we return to our story, Mary Wesley is at the Leeds Jewelry Store. And what can I do for you, miss? I'm not sure. Uh, Are you Mr. Leeds? Yes, I am. Well, um, this may sound sort of silly, but I'd like to know about that big clock out in front of your store. I hope you don't want to buy it. (laughs) No, no, I just would like to know how accurate it is. Oh, it's the most accurate clock in town, miss. We have it checked once a week. It loses hardly a second. I see. When was it checked last? Uh, why, uh, four days ago. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, where's the nearest public phone? Oh, if you want to use a phone, you may use mine right there on the desk. Thank you. Oh, that's quite all right. Hello? Blackie, this is Mary. You found out about the clock? Yes, it's always right, and it was checked four days ago. Good. Now I'm absolutely sure Matthews is innocent. I'm going up to tell him for two reasons. 
to make him happy and Faraday miserable. All right, Matthews. You might as well talk. I didn't come to your apartment to outstay you. I don't have anything to talk about, Inspector Faraday. You killed Paul Blaine, so you ought to have a lot to talk about. I didn't kill him, Inspector. I, I admit I had a reason. He sent me to jail, but I didn't kill him. That's what they all tell me. Until I prove they're lying. Who's that at the door? One of your pals, Matthews? I don't know who it is. Well, go answer it. But no tricks. Don't worry. I don't have anything to hide. This is Harry Matthews' apartment? Yes, I'm Harry Matthews. Blanky, for Pete's sake, what are you doing here? Just playing newsboy. Good news, boy, I might say. Blackie, I didn't kill Blaine. Don't let this guy arrest me. Don't worry, Harry. I wouldn't let Faraday do anything he'd be sorry for. Look, what do you mean, I'd be sorry? Harry here is the one who's going to be sorry. He's going to jail. Is he? When was Blaine killed? At three o'clock yesterday. You know that. All right. Take a look at this. What is it? A picture of Harry and his girlfriend walking down 20th Street a good five miles away from the scene of the crime. Taken yesterday, too. There's a date on it. Look. I am looking. So what? So look at the clock behind them. What time does it say? Well, I'll... It says three o'clock. That's right. And do you know what time it is now, Faraday? Huh? What's that it's got to do... It's time you apologized to an innocent man and got out of here. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, uh, I'm sorry, Matthews. Yeah, okay. And um, Blackie, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah. Mm. Thanks, Blackie. You're a big help to me. You've just cost me my only suspect. Don't fret, Faraday. What I take away, I usually put back. I've got another one for you. Come on, Harry. I'd like you to drive me down to see him right now. This is Blaine's pawn shop right here, Harry. Thanks for driving me. No, no, no trouble, Blackie. It was nice seeing you, Blackie. Thanks, Helen, and thanks for the lift. Okay. Oh, say... Would you wait for me for a few minutes? I'm going to want to get to my bank and I may not be able to get a car. Sure, sure, we'll wait. But you better hurry. The bank closes in a few minutes. I guess I shouldn't have stopped to pick up Helen. That's all right. We'll make it. How far do you bank? Down on 25th Street. The Weatherly National, Blackie? Yes, Helen, why? Why, that's my bank, too. <laughs> well, we're practically partners, then, Helen. <laughs> yeah. I'll be out in a minute. You want me to go with you? No, thanks, Matthews. I like to do things like this alone. Be right back. Hurry, or you'll be too late to get to the bank. All right. Good afternoon. Yeah? What's good about it? Well, that's fine, talk. You own this shop? I'm John Blaine, if that's what you mean. I'm Boston Blackie. Hooray. So you're Boston Blackie. So what? So I'd like to talk to you. Maybe about the killing of your brother. What makes you think I killed him? You were having an argument when I called up yesterday afternoon and spoke to your brother. So what? So an argument could end in a killing. So could too much curiosity. Get out of here, Blackie. Fast. Now, is that a nice way to do business, John? Your brother Paul never pulled a gun on a visitor. Get out of here, I said. When I'm finished. You're finished now. Get out of here. Maybe this will help you move. You missed me, my friend. Or should I wait till I try to turn my head? I missed you because I wanted to. But next time... Maybe I won't want to miss. I wish I'd known you were having trouble with John Blaine, Blackie. I could have run out and given you a hand. I didn't mind arguing with him, Harry. It was the back talk from his gun I couldn't do anything about. Blackie, I want to thank you for helping Harry out of his trouble. He's not out completely yet, Helen. What? He isn't, Blackie. Why isn't he? Oh, it's nothing to get excited about. I just wasn't able to prove John Blaine is a 100% suspect. And until I do, Faraday will always feel like Harry here is guilty. Well, as long as you believe I'm innocent. You're safe. Even Faraday has, has to face the facts. You couldn't have killed Blaine. You're too far away from the scene of the murder when Blaine was killed. Oh, say, it's too late for me to get to the bank, isn't it? Yeah, I guess it is. Oh, dear, that's a shame. It is after three o'clock, isn't it? Slightly. Say, do either of you have enough money to cash a check if it isn't too big? Well, all I've got is five. How about you, Helen? No, I don't think I... Oh, wait, I might have some. Yes, I... Why, yes, of course I do. Swell, could you spare 50, Helen? 50? I don't... Oh, what? Oh, dear, what's the matter with me? I drew a hundred out of the bank yesterday. You did? Yes, it was yesterday... 
I remember I got to the bank just at closing time, and I had to argue with the man at the door to let me in. Here's the money you wanted, Blackie. Oh, how much did you ask for? Just 50. Oh, yes. 40, 50. Here. You can make a check out later. All right, thanks. That's all right. I could give you more if you wanted it. No, thanks. You've given me plenty already. Hmm. That sidewalk photographer must have a mania for putting fancy locks on his door. <laughs> this one's tougher than the one I picked yesterday, Mary. Yeah, it sure seems to be. But what are we going to find by breaking into this dark room again? Oh, nothing much, Mary. Just this. How Helen Waltham could have been with Harry Matthews in front of Leeds Jewelry Store having a picture taken at 3 o'clock yesterday and still be in her bank at closing time. That's 3 o'clock. I know it's my bank, too. Mm. There, that opened the lock. Good. But about the time, that's impossible, darling. The clock on Leeds Jewelry Store is never wrong. I know it. But why would Helen say she was in her bank at closing time if she wasn't? She was very definite about that. Yeah, I know. So you said. Come on. Let's go into the dark room. I'm going to take a look at that picture again. All right. Wait, I'll turn on the light. There. Blackie, you think the picture of Harry and Helen was faked? We touched or something? No, it wasn't. Or I would have noticed it. The picture was real. The clock wasn't wrong. So there's only one answer to this whole thing. What? I said there's only one answer, Mary. I didn't say I knew what it was. Oh. Let's see. Do you remember the number of that picture of Harry and Helen? I sure do. 4121. Uh, uh, yeah. Here's the index file. 4121. 4121. Where is that? Oh, here we are. Mm-hmm. It's a legitimate picture, all right. So where are we? Right back where we started. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Oh, wait a minute. I've got a hunch. This is picture 4121. Let's have a look at picture number 4120 and see what that looks like. Well, what do you think that'll show? Well, I don't know. That's why I want to look at it. 4120, 4120. Ah, here it is, already developed. Yeah, taken at the same spot. That's good. Let me look at it, too. A picture of a woman and a little girl. Well, that's not much. But, Mary, look at the clock behind them. For goodness sake, there's a man on a ladder doing something to it. Yes, looks as if he's cleaning it. And look, Mary, look at the time. It's 3.30. 3.30? Yes. And do you know what that means? It means the picture was taken before picture number 4120, and yet the clock says 3.30. So picture number 4121 showing Harry and Helen had to be taken after 3.30. Blackie. Then Harry could have killed Paul Blaine. He not only could have, Mary, but he probably did. That guy on the ladder there is obviously Harry's accomplice. He was planted to set back the clock so that Harry could have an alibi when his picture was taken. Wow. Wow is right. So it was Harry and not John Blaine after all. I should have known John acted too guilty to be guilty. Come on. It's going to hurt to do this, but I've got to call Faraday and tell him that he was right about Matthews. It's a lovely day for a walk, isn't it, Blackie? Beautiful, Mary. Is that beautiful, Mary, or beautiful Mary? (laughs) Take your choice. (laughs) Well, I've taken it, and so I thank you, kind sir. Hey, Blackie. Yes? Why did Harry Matthews call Inspector Faraday and tell him you were at the scene of Paul Blaine's murder? Oh, that's easy, Mary. Two reasons. He wanted to involve me, and he... Wanted to make sure the police established the time of the murder at 3 o'clock so his alibi with the fixed-up clock would stand up. He probably was hiding in the back of the pawn shop while we were talking to Paul Blaine the day of the murder. Oh, I see. That guy Matthews was clever, Mary. He never once offered an alibi. He knew it would be too phony if he did. He waited for me to supply it for him, and I did, by discovering that sidewalk photographer's picture. Yeah, he was clever, all right. He killed Paul Blaine for revenge, didn't he? But uh, he made one mistake, you know. Hmm? He didn't go to the trouble to find out where his friend Helen was at exactly three o'clock. No, thanks to her, we broke the case. I certainly was glad Faraday didn't involve her. Harry was obviously just using it. Here you are, matey. 
Blackie, did you see what just happened? What? A sidewalk photographer just snapped our picture. Well, how do you like that? Why does everything happen to us? Well, I don't know, but it certainly does. Blackie, tell me, how do sidewalk photographers like this fellow know whose picture to take? How? Well, Mary, that's simple. Snap judgment, that's all. Just snap judgment. Oh. <laughs> I'm now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Café Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, The Broken Wing. There's a saying I've heard around Cairo that all a man needs for happiness is good food and good companions. Me, I add one thing more. That's lots of sleep. So naturally, I don't like it when somebody comes pounding at my tambourine door at 2 o'clock in the morning. But that's what happened. And the pounding got wilder and wilder. So I finally got up, put on my shoes and a robe, and went down that balcony steps into the cafe. Mr. Jarman! I beg you! Open the door! All right! Cut up the noise. I'm coming. Please, Mr. Jordan, wait me. I switched on the front light. Through the door glass, I could make out a stooped figure, gray-bearded in burnous and fez. I threw the latch, opened the door, and he bowed down, groveling at my feet. I look, Buster. Just get up and state your business. Oh, Mr. Jordan, my true effendi. I come to you on my knees. Ben Abram. Alwa, it is I, Ben, of the once honored house of Abram. Ben Abram, you don't have to bow down to me. You should know that. Thus, I express my distress, Mr. Jordan. Well, look, if there's something wrong, tell me. My good Effendi, you will recall that when you first came to Cairo, I was able to do you a small service. Oh, you bet I remember. You stood between me and certain of your own people who want to give me trouble. Believe me, I've never forgotten it. It was not with the thought of ever asking a service in return. Sure, I knew that. I owe a great debt to you, Ben Abram. Mr. Jordan, I must entrust to you... My greatest treasure for you to guard and protect. A treasure? Well, sure. There are many things I cannot explain to you, my Effendi. You must only trust. I trust you just as you trust me. It has been written. A promise is a man's most priceless gift. You have my promise. Now, where is this treasure? Allah be praised. Wait here for a moment. And Abram ducked quietly down the sidewalk to a dark doorway. In another second, he was coming back. But this time, he wasn't alone. Just two steps behind came someone else. And I didn't see who it was until he stepped aside to tenderly draw her before me. A slight but erect figure in native robes. And all I could see was her soft, dark eyes above the veil that covered her face. Mr. Jordan, my only daughter... Tarina. Your daughter? Mashallah. She is my treasure. Guard her with your life. Oh, wait a minute, Ben Abram. You can't be leaving her with me. I have no choice. It is your promise. Oh, I know I promise. Farewell, but... Tarina, my child. Saida, my father. I commend her to you, Mr. Jordan. Hide her quickly. Allah protect Ben Abram, wait. Ah. Ah. This beats anything yet. My master is not pleased. Oh, everything's just fine. Great. I am most happy, my master. Look, would you mind not calling me... Oh, skip it. As you wish, my master. It's just that uh, there's no place for a girl like you. But you are here. Uh, that's just it, I... My uh... father says that you will protect me. From what, Tarina? He does not permit me to tell... But in all else, 
I am at your command. Uh, sure. What now? Where do you want me to sleep? Sleep? Oh, uh, up those back steps. It's all yours. But will you not show me? Yeah, that's the way you want it. Up this way. I will follow my master. Uh, there's the bed. Fresh sheets are over there. Where will you sleep? Uh, outside, lady. Just give me time to get a few things out of here. Uh, wait, Serena. Yes? What happened to the veil? In her own quarters, a woman does not wear the veil. Did you not know? Uh, no. I trust my master will sleep well. Thanks. Then I was outside, but I still had my problem. A girl with the innocent round face of the Nile people of foreigner rarely sees. A face that trusted me for protection. From what, I had no idea. I started for my office downstairs, then changed my mind and bedded down on a stair landing just outside the door. The floor was hard and the strange puzzle that had been handed me didn't help with the sleep. But I finally dozed off. I slept for maybe two hours and I was suddenly sitting up wide awake. I slammed the door open in time to see two big robed figures coming in through the shattered window from the adjoining roof. I made a dive for the first one. It was like tackling a spook pillar. He wrestled me more like a bear than a man. I got a lucky chance and he went over my head and spooked me. I was set for the second one and my fist drove him back. He lunged at me. I ducked and let him go by and turned to meet number one. I must have the chair. I saw the chair coming down, but I was too late. It caught me above the left ear. I was on the floor telling myself to get up, only I didn't. When I finally cleared away some of the cobwebs, the room was empty. From below, I heard the crash of a door being broken open. I threw on some things in quick time, was down through the cafe, through the open door, and out onto the street. Far off down the dark street, I heard running footsteps, and I followed. They were always far enough ahead, so I couldn't see. When I reached the Sharia Ragoon, they were still nowhere in sight. I hesitated, and I stopped as a little form moved out of the shadows. Boxes, if Boxes for a poor blind man. Uh, how much does it cost to see a few things? Fendi, I am a helpless man, very poor. A couple of big Egyptians with a girl. Which way they go? Uh, but the, the dark it is everywhere. I see nothing. No bakshi. Yeah, yeah. This help? Ah, the piastres. But wait, Fendi, wait. Come on, you don't have to test them. They're good. As you say, Fendi, they are genuine. Uh, what do you see now? Only two piastres. There's some more, but not till you tell me. Ah, suddenly the eyes of this humble man pierce the veil. I'll make it four piastres. Uh, they went into that great white house over the Nile. Now, dear, go buy yourself some carrots. Muta Shakir, the In two minutes more, I had reached the great house on the Nile. All white symbol of power in Egypt. A front gate led to the wide courtyard, and I kept going past the fountain toward the main door till two guards quickly moved from their rooms to bar my way. The intruder will be gone. Uh, I got lots of business here. The house of Sheikh el Bey sleeps. Well, let's wake him up. Back. The unbeliever is asking trouble. A lot of trouble you don't want to get mixed up in, brother. To the streets with you. It is a command. Yeah, well, I'm going the other way. Uh -huh. But uh, it is El Hatbe. Who comes to disturb the quiet of my house? An Americani, master. Let him approach me. The guards let go of my arms, and Sheikh El Hatbe waited on the steps before the door. I couldn't help being fascinated with what I saw. Not the colored robes, or the fares that topped a slim face accented by a well clipped beard. It was something perched on his shoulder, a Baza falcon, its beady eyes, hooked beak and talons gleaming in the moonlight. By what right does an infidel come at this hour? Little case of kidnapping, Elhad Bey. What is your name? The name's Rocky Jordan. Now, where's Tarina? She is quite safe. She is of no interest to such as you. Think again. Tarina was sleeping at my cafe. Mashallah. She was brought there by her father, Ben Abram. I promised to protect her. You know what a promise means. It was not yours to give. But you admit Tarina was brought here against her will. By the orders of my honored nephew, Fing al I, as his guardian, since the death of his father, give my blessing. 
Your nephew sent those two muscle boys to drag the girl from her bed? It was his right. Yeah, well, not in my books, El Hot Bay. Mr. Jordan, it is obvious you have much to learn of the ways of the East. Until then, you had best accept my word. What about Ben Abram's word? It is like dirt at my feet. Supposing the police get wind of this, what will they think? May I suggest that you go now and find out? And leave this house in peace? Eh, not till I see Tarina and get her story. You will not defile her again by your presence? Let her decide that. Then I have no choice. Batar, Shamak! Throw this unbeliever into the street! I will, Master. <laughs> I rolled over three times, got up and started back to the gate Till I saw the knives the guards had pulled out from somewhere Then I knew getting to Torino right now would be about as easy as stealing the Sphinx But it looked like the best thing I could do was to go to Ben Abram and admit I'd failed him That took me all the way across Cairo to the East Hills When I got to Ben Abram's house, it was empty There was no sign of him, so I waited in the court He finally showed up almost an hour later He came staggering in at the point of exhaustion Great red marks across his face and his robe spotted with blood. I got to him and helped him to a bench. Please. Please, my friend. My welfare is nothing. But you've been hurt. Look, I'll get you to a doctor. No, tell me of my daughter. Why do you not guard her? I've got bad news, Ben Abram. Oh, tell me quickly. Tarina's in the house of El Hud Bay. It cannot be. I know, I promised. But well, two men got in from the roof. They were a little too much for me. They got her away, and I followed them to Sheikh El Hadbe's house. Then there is nothing more. She was taken there by orders of his nephew. El Hadbe told me he had the right. Yes, it is as he says. No man has that right. You know, I think it's time you made a few things clear. Yes, I must tell you now. Mr. Jordan, I loved my daughter more than my life. It was my desire that she marry in dignity. It has been written, an unwed daughter is like a broken wing. Sure, Abram. Three years ago, Mr. Jordan, while Tarina was but a child, I promised her as wife to Fingal Jarus, the nephew of El Had Bey. But since then, I have learned many things about Jarus. He is a kelp, a vicious man who would bring her nothing but sorrow. I think I'm beginning to see. A few days ago, Jarus came to me demanding that I bring Tarina to him as wife. I begged him to release me from my promise, but he would not listen. Yeah, but as her father... Oh, no, Mr. Jordan. She was his by right of our law. And Fingal would not listen. He threatened to take her from me. I could not entrust her to one of my own people. That's when you brought her to my place. Yes, I was willing to face dishonor to suffer humiliation, but my daughter must be protected from that man. What happened to me was nothing. Yeah, looks like I let you down. I am only grateful for your efforts, Mr. Jordan. No, there is no way of getting her back. But look, we can do something. No, man's efforts are as nothing against the will of Allah. It was his decree... That my promise be fulfilled. I tried a couple of arguments, but all I met with was despair. I could tell Ben Abram wanted to be left alone, so I finally walked away. Just as I reached the gate, a black limousine pulled up. The back door opened, and after carefully adjusting his fez, out stepped Captain Sam Sabaya, Cairo Police. You will stay with me, Jordan. What's the complaint, Sam? You will learn in good time once I have talked with Ben Abram. He's right there in the courtyard. Come along. Ben Abram. Bismillah, Sapaya Bey. It is with regret that I do not come as a guest of your house. Then for what purpose? To ask if you last night were in the home of Sheikh al Bey. You do not answer. Supposing he was, Sam. What about One him? moment, Jordan. Ben Abram, the marks on your face as from sharp claws. How do you explain them? It is as you say. They are the marks of the falcon. I was at El Had Bey's house. With the bird, he drove me away. Okay, Sam, maybe you'll be interested to know I was there too. I do know. Jordan, have I not warned you to keep away from such affairs as this, which do not concern you or any other foreigner? Abram entrusted Serena to my care. To me, what has happened is kidnapped. I know our ways aren't always the same. Indeed, they are not, Jordan. 
Look, how about getting to the point? The nephew of Alhard Bey is dead. Slain by the knife. <gasps> You're not accusing one of us. Perhaps that is not necessary. Wait. At what time was Vingard killed? But a short time after your daughter was brought to the house. Very well. It is best that I confess. Ben I killed Vingard. Now do with me what you will. <laughs> You are listening to The Broken Wing, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Don't miss the brand new comedy show coming up tomorrow night on most of these same stations. And steady now, it's called Breakfast with Burroughs. Yes, the fellow who wrote The Girl with the Three Blue Eyes, the man who gets up so late he has breakfast in the middle of Monday evening, will be on hand with a bright, new, highly original program. And as though you hadn't guessed, his first name is Abe. So tomorrow, don't please don't go to bed until you've had breakfast with Abe Burroughs on CBS tomorrow night at 6.30. Now we return you to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, The Broken Wing. Well, ordinarily, I don't mix in family feuds, especially in Cairo. But I owed a debt to Ben Abram. When he entrusted his daughter, Tarina, to my protection, I had no choice. And I failed. Tarina was captured by her promised husband. Shortly after that, he was killed. When confronted with the news, Ben Abram confessed to the murder. Sam Sabaya took us to headquarters, got my story, and put Ben Abram in a cell. Then he let me stay with the old man for a few minutes, and I tried to get some sense out of him. My good Effendi, it is for the best. I don't see it that way, Ben Abram. But you must not concern yourself about me. I just don't think you're a man who would kill, that's all. Mr. Jordan, can you not see? What does murder mean to a soul that is already lost? Tarina is now free from the rash promise I once made. Look, you still have time to change that confession. No, no please leave me now. I ask but one thing of you. Yeah? The happiness of my daughter. I leave her in your hands forever. I left him then. Ben Abram had given me a tall order, but I had to do what I could. Anyhow, I wanted to clear up a few things in my own mind, so I went back down to the big white house of Sheikh Elhad Bay on the banks of the Nile. There was a steady stream of friends and relatives going in by way of the court. The bay was there at the door, greeting the mourners. The falcon still perched on his shoulder. Have I not sent you once from this house? I uh, just came back to set things right, Elhad Bay. At another time, Jordan. My most gracious, Elhad Bay. What would you have, woman? It is I whom you summon for a few pieces of silver I come to mourn for the departed one. It is well. Take the silver. Uh, Retire now to the upper chambers and well with the others. Not a shock here. No, no, Molly. No, no, Molly. A moment, woman. Your grief is most restrained. Perhaps a few more pieces of silver. Mm, the bay is most generous. Hey, now, uh, how about a word with me, huh? Have you not gone? I just want you to know, getting mixed up in this wasn't my idea. You have come to tell me that... Sheik Elhard Bey, the last thing I want to do is meddle in the affairs of your people. I hope you believe that. I regret very much the death of your nephew. I will make peace with you. Peace, my love. Thanks. Do you mind telling me where Tarina is? She has no place in my house now. The girl is gone. Where? I do not know. I see. Oh, uh, one thing more. I'd like to see Fingal's body. It has not been prepared for burial. As a special favor? Then I'll go. Very well. I cannot refuse. This way, please. The adjoining room. My nephew is here. The only son of my elder brother. Yeah. 
I pray you spend little time. A uh, bandage on his chest. The knife was there. You think Ben Abram did it? By his own confession. For this outrage against my house, he also will die. Well, I took my cue and got out. Elhard Bay had no reason that I could see to lie about Tarina. I knew she wasn't there. But there was no stopping now, till I'd found her and set Ben Abram's mind at rest. I took the long trip back out to Abram's place, but Tarina wasn't to be found. I tried a few people I knew were Abram's friends, and they'd seen nothing of her. For an American man, to find a veiled Muslim girl poses too many problems. And I was finally back at Ben Abram's cell, telling him his daughter was gone. You must find her, Rafinti. Where would she be? What's she hiding from? She's a tender child, only frightened. This has been a terrible ordeal for her. You still say you killed Fingo? There was no other way. Can you not see... I had a look at Fingo. I'm uh, surprised you went for his throat. It had to be done quickly. The knife at the throat is certain. Ben Abram, you got a promise for me. That still stands. But from now on, I gotta have the truth. I do not understand. Fingal was stabbed in the chest. Only you didn't know that. Not the throat at all. It does not matter. Well, it does to me. Now, come on, admit it. You didn't kill him. Say what you will. Uh, I thought so. You're covering for Tarina, aren't you? You think she did it? She could have. Please forget this thing, Mr. Jordan. I am an old, disgraced man. She's young with a full life before her. But the fact that you didn't do it... I alone am responsible for her sorrow. Should I not pay the penalty? I am not the one to decide that. Mr. Jordan, before Allah, I swear the guilt shall remain on my shoulders. That's when I left Ben Abram. From now on, it was up to Tarina. She'd have to make the choice. But right then, I was kind of beat. I went back to the tambourine, drew a beer from the tap, and went up the steps and went back to my room where I could do some thinking. Where I'd find Tarina or where the search would begin was anybody's guess. But when I opened the door to my room, that much was answered. I await my master. Tarina! Where have you been? It was the command of my father that I remain here. I return as soon as possible. But how? Nobody saw you. A veiled girl could not enter by the door of this place. I came as the others last night, by the roof. You sure know how to get around. My master, I would learn of my father. Where is he? He's in jail, Tarina, for the murder of Fingal. But what does my father say? He confessed, to me and everybody else. It is as I feared. I prayed to Allah it would not be so. Yeah, now it's up to you whether he stays there or not. I do not understand. I would do anything. So happens I know Ben Abram didn't kill Fingal. You say he confessed. Is it not so? Only to protect you, Serena. He thinks you did it. And maybe I do too. No. No, that is not true. I said it's up to you, Serena. Keep quiet and you know what'll happen to your father. He thinks that'll make you happy, but I don't. My master, let me speak. It is true that my father gave me the knife charging me to protect myself. When I was taken before Fingal in the house of his uncle, he swore he would have me as wife. It was then that I drew the knife. All right, let's have the rest of it. I drove it at his chest. But I am weak and he was strong. The knife only scratched him. He threw me back in great fury and left the room, shouting I should be taken to the harem. I did not see him again. You think anyone's going to believe that, Tarina? They have only to look at the wound, my master. Captain Zabaya speaking. Uh, Rocky, Sam. Yes, Jordan. Uh, has there been an autopsy on Fingal, Jerus? Autopsy? Certainly not. For what possible reason do you ask? Well, you better do it, Sam. You'll find out some things. I will do no such thing. Besides, the burial procession leaves within the hour. Then get busy. There still may be time to stop it. Jordan, you know that cannot be done without cause. All you have to do is check on Sheik El Bey's background. He was uh, quite a gambler, Sam. Find out how he stands financially. 
You'll get a surprise. What are you driving at, Jordan? Fingal was the only son of Elhad Bey's elder brother. Now they're both dead. Who stands to benefit most by Fingal's death? That is of no consequence. We have the confessed murderer. But it's all wrong. Hurry, Sam. Meet me at Elhard Bay's house in ten minutes. Jordan, you will not go to that place at such a time. Think again, Sammy. I'll see you there. What would you have me do, Master? Stay right here, Tarina. Keep those pretty little fingers crossed. I was off again for the big white house of Sheik Elhard Bay. This time, I knew the reason why. In nine minutes flat, I was there, and I didn't make it any too soon. A funeral procession was already moving out across the court. They had a drum beating, and along with the whalers, all in all, it promised to be a first-class affair. Right in the lead came Sheik Elhad Bey, falcon and all. Stand from the gate, Jordan. You're uh, rushing things a little, aren't you, Elhad Bey? Can you not see the procession has begun? Why not the usual three-day wait? Afraid the police and come nosing around, maybe? Silence. The infidel would not desecrate the dead. Yeah, uh, by the way, just how did Fingal die? By the knife of Ben Abram. Sure. You want your nephew buried real quick so everyone will keep on believing that, right? Of what do you speak now? Supposing an autopsy proved the knife wound was nothing but a scratch. You knew Tarina tried to stab Fingal but didn't kill him. So you decided to finish the job. Guard your words, Jordan. How'd you do it, with poison? Well, it's easy to find out, Elhud. The main thing is you knew the blame would go to either Tarina or Ben Abram. You didn't care which. And you'd have the family of wealth. Guards! Remove the lying infidel! They needn't bother. I was just going for a chat with the Cairo police. Before I could turn, the giant falcon was on me, striking with terrific power and driving me to the ground. I scrambled to my feet, shielding my face with my arms as the bird knifed in with its sharp claws. My shirt was in ribbons, my arms and head slashed in a dozen places. Now the falcon began circling and striking with its powerful wings, driving me down again. I braced myself for the third strike, but it never came. It was just one shot, and the winged killer lay dead at my feet. Uh, maybe it was loss of blood or exhaustion or downright fear. Maybe all three. Anyhow, for a while after that, I didn't know much. It was water on my face that brought me out of it. I was lying by the fountain. The procession had vanished except for a couple of police at the gate. I was getting personal attention from Sam Sabaya. No, no, no. Lie quietly, Jordan. I will soon have the bleeding stopped. Oh, is there... Is there anything you can't do, Sam? <laughs> when one must contend with your unpredictable escapes, Jordan, much knowledge is necessary. What about Sheik Elhard? As you said, Jordan, Fengal's knife wound was superficial. The Sheik is being held pending an autopsy. Oh, the... And my hunch was right. The fact that the Sheik made this bizarre attempt on your life is proof enough at the moment. What about... Ben Arbor. I have ordered his immediate release. Uh, Jordan, is uh, there nothing more you wish to ask? What about? Tarina. As Ben Abram reminds me, a promise is a man's most priceless gift. What are you getting at? He says he has promised his daughter to you, Jordan. Oh, no. Not on your life. Look, look, you've got to talk to him. <laughs> Calm yourself, Jordan. I have convinced him that you will release him from his promise. You will not have to marry the girl. <laughs> Sam, why don't you mind your own business? It's CBS again at this same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Rocky Jordan, written by Gomer Cool and Larry Roman, stars Jack Moyles in the title role and was produced by Cliff Howell and directed tonight by Gordon T. Hughes, with original music by Richard Arant. 
Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>